Uh, so, so let me first sort of you know um, introduce to you what my lab does in one or two slides, because my lab does not specialize in biological or biomedical applications, right? And so you know even though that is the case, I think this is the ideal forum to take advantage of sort of the sort of different disciplines coming together. A lot of I looked at the list of participants. A lot of you are engineers. Some of you are chemists. There's also one or two physicists in the mix. So, so it'll be a, you know, you, you'll, you'll see how you can use principles that you learn from engineering, physics, and chemistry, and apply them to biomedicine. And, and my own personal story in this particular space is, is, is that I, during my PhD, I was a, a, a physical chemist working for, you know, working for a lab that um, uh, does inorganic nanoscience, works with metal nanoparticles. And some of the principles that we discovered or found are now finding applications in biomedicine and uh, biological imaging. And back then, we couldn't even predict what the scale of these applications would be, right? And so I'll share with you some of those examples. And you'll see that there is a lot of merit to doing good engineering, sometimes which may not even have uh, an immediate connection to biological applications, but down the line, it may end up be becoming uh, uh, an important principle behind a diagnostic tool and, and so on. Okay, so that's my, my group right here, and uh, Sarah is here. Uh, and my group basically, uh, uh, so, uh, basically focuses on watching chemical reactions on the nanoscale using microscopy. Okay, so I, I don't have time to tell you about my research. I'll just share with you one video of the kind of data that my lab gets. So what I'm showing you here are little particles of silver, and from Terry Odom's talk, we are all familiar with these. And what you're seeing on the screen are little silver particles in a simple optical microscope. It's called a dark field microscope that a lot of molecular biology labs have. And you're able to, from the strong scattering of these silver particles, you're able to visualize individual ones. What my lab does well is visualize these particles under in situ conditions where they're undergoing reactions. So watching them inside tiny reactors. So what I'm showing you is a snapshot of a reactor where little silver particles are immobilized and we are flowing in gold salt. And when you flow gold into, gold into a solution of silver particles, the silver, which is unstable, exchanges with gold and you make gold nanoshells hollow gold nanoshells. This is a synthetic technique for making gold nanoshells. And you often do this in a flask and you, you see color changes. What I'm showing you here is you're watching this reaction take place on the level of single particles. So to show you the kind of microscopy we do, and there's a whole range of information, new information we can collect by watching these at the single particle level. I'm not going to go into detail, this is just to give you a flavor of the kind of techniques and approaches we apply in my lab, okay? Those are, you see uh, time on the right hand side, and you're watching as you're flowing gold salt, and all of a sudden you see a s silver particle shrink. And the shrunken particle is actually a gold particle, which scatters less light, right? So all of a sudden, so what we learned from this experiment is that the reaction from silver to gold is a sudden reaction. Each particle waits for a certain amount of time, and then all of a sudden decides to make a switch to a gold nano cage. It's not gradual as we would have thought had we not looked at the single particle level, okay? And from this we are learning about the mechanistics of, of such reactions and so on. This is just to give you a flavor. Okay, what's my purpose here? My purpose is to give you a preview of the lab module that you'll, you'll be, you'll be uh, uh, I think all of you will be uh, having a chance to do some hands-on simulations and design work on Wednesday and Thursday. And uh, Sarah, who's here, and Jeremy Smith, two of my uh, third year graduate students, will be uh, helping you with this lab module, right? So the main objective is, of this lab module is to develop a hands-on understanding. I, I promise you, by the end of the lab module, uh, along with the principles I share in this lecture, you'll have some idea of how to simulate optical properties of nanostructures geared towards specific bio applications, okay? And uh, we'll focus on certain certain experiments like effect of shape, effect of size. And you heard a lot of, lot of this in the previous talk and also through your le reading in literature, but this will, be your, this will be your opportunity to do this firsthand, 
first hand discover a particular way to tune the plasma on resonances, okay? So that's, that's the main objective. And so I'm not going to talk to you about very recent research results. What I'm going to tell you about are established principles, principles that have been established and developed over the last 10 years. And, and I'll do that by means of specific examples and, and stories that I was personally involved in as a graduate student, a postdoc, and to some extent, you know, even my career here at Illinois. Feel free to ask me questions because like I said, a lot of this will have principles of physics and optics. Uh, although there will be biomedical applications, I'm not a biologist, okay? I'm not a, uh, I, I have no expertise in biomedical engineering. So feel free to share so that we can learn from each other. Okay, so this is how I motivate uh, this talk, right? Why metal nanoparticles? Why are they so important in biology? Uh, Professor Odom already gave you sort of one of the big motivations, size scales. They have similar size scales. Biomolecules, cellular structures, and metal particles have similar size scales, and that, that's one of the big motivations. I have a slightly different motivation because I'm talking about nanostructures that are optically interesting, that have interesting optical properties. For a range of applications nowadays, biosensing, determination of structure, biological imaging, Theragnostics, for instance, you know, if you think of a technique such as optical coherence tomography, what does it involve? It involves the interaction of light with matter, right? A lot of these applications. So if you understand light-matter interactions well, you can understand these applications or maybe even design future applications. Okay, now it turns out that conventionally, if you think about uh, light-matter interactions conventionally, it turns out there is a disparity in the length scales, okay? Uh, how large is a biomolecule? What's the typical size of a biomolecule? If you just had to give an order of magnitude an answer. Nanometer, I think that's what I heard, a nanometer. What's the typical length scale of light? How do you think of the length scale of light? The wavelength of light. What are the typical wavelengths of visible and infrared light? A thousand nanometers, a micron. That's a thousand fold disparity in the length scales. And it turns out, you know, if you look into the physics, it turns out that light and molecules don't have as high of an interaction because of this disparity in length scales, right? If you wanted to confine light down to a very small spot, this is known as the diffraction limit. Some of you may have heard about this. If you try and focus light down with a magnifying glass, the smallest spot you can make is roughly around 500 nanometers, right? So you can't localize light with the resolution of a biomolecule, okay? And so that's one of the challenges that we've learned to overcome since we've uh, started making these nanostructures. So, so that's the disparity in, in length scales that we've somehow broken by using these metallic nanoparticles. How do these metallic nanoparticles achieve that? So I'm talking of, about nanoparticles of gold, silver, and copper. When you shine light on these particles, these nanoparticles have a whole bunch of free electrons. These are metals. And these free electrons oscillate back and forth in resonance with the electromagnetic field of light. And this resonance takes place with visible frequencies of light, okay? And that's why these nanoparticles have extremely strong visible colors, okay? So this oscillation of electrons back and forth in resonance with, the, with light that, that is incident on a nanoparticle is known as a localized surface plasmon resonance. That's too many words, so we'll just call it plasmons, right? And this field is called plasmonics. And so today my, my job is to give you a flavor of plasmonics and to some extent some hands-on uh, skills and knowledge. So we are talking about plasmons, okay? And now uh, this is a resonant interaction. Each little particle is like an antenna. An antenna that absorbs certain frequencies of light. Um, and you can tune that frequency as you learn in many different ways, okay? All right, so our fascination with metal nanoparticles and even our familiarity with metal nanoparticles and their amazing optical properties isn't new. It turns out we've known these from medieval times, right? These are actual artworks. Right, that's the Lycurgus cup. It still exists today. This is from the, the fourth century, and it's stained with these silver gold particles. That TM image isn't from the fourth century, I promise you. That's from recent times, right? So when they took a little piece of that, someone allowed them to do that, and they imaged this, and they found out this is silver and gold. 
uh, uh, back then, our ancestors did not know that these are metal metallic particles. They knew they were, these were metals in there that were giving rise to these bright colors. And so, you know, in, in, in scattering, this looks green, and in absorption, in transmission, it looks red. And so that's sort of, you know, a, a preview of the optical properties of, of metal nanoparticles. So we've known these materials, and even their properties for such a long time. Why now? Why is it that we are now being, becoming interested in them. It turns out that now we have better control over their synthesis. We can make them in a wide range of shapes, and we saw the neat nanostar example from Professor Odom, and that's just one shape. There are a whole range of complex structures we can engineer. And we understand their optical properties in great details, right? Quantitative details, as well as we have a great understanding of what actually happens on the nanoscale in terms of the light matter interaction. Right? It's not just phenomenological anymore where we are satisfied with the color. We actually understand about the subtle details and you'll see some of them. So the first thing I want to tell you about, this is sort of a busy slide because I'm sort of making some comparisons. This is what the absorption, extinction, are all of you familiar with an extinction spectrum? Extinction is the sum of absorption and scattering. Right? That's what you measure in a UV vis spectrophotometer. If you take a UV vis absorption spectrum of gold nanoparticles, you see a peak around 520 nanometers. These are gold spheres. And that peak is associated with the surface plasma and resonance of gold nanospheres, right? That's where the natural oscillation frequency is. That's where the antenna resonance is in the green region. Now, uh, you can, uh, you, using uv vis spectrometry, you can actually measure absorption coefficients, extinction coefficients, scattering coefficients. And it turns out on resonance right here, if you calculate or you estimate the absorption uh, uh, coefficient or cross-section, it is five or six orders of magnitude larger than the dye molecules you know that, that are used in, as contrast agents, one example being ICG or rhodamine 6G, five or six orders of magnitude larger, both scattering and absorption. And that's the immediate appeal of these nanoparticles, right? Because you can use one nanoparticle to do really localized sensing or delivery of heat, okay? Uh, and so that's the, the biggest motivation. Um, so on resonance, they have very high cross-sections. This is an example of how the large scattering cross-sections are attractive for applications. What you're seeing here are tiny little anisotropic nanoparticles. Each one of them is a single nanoparticle. And this is a simple microscope, very simple technology, nothing fancy, not a fancy camera, but you can visualize in great, you know, with great uh, sensitivity, each individual particle. And each particle here has a size of about 60 nanometers, right? And so, in a sense, you now have an array of sensors that are 60 nanometers small. You can pack a lot of these inside a cell, and each one can report on the local environment in the cell, right? And that's the appeal. You're getting a much higher spatial resolution of the kind of imaging you're doing. In this particular case, I'm just showing you an example of uh, the polarization of this particle. When you rotate a polarizer, these particles are anisotropic, and as you rotate the polarization, they, they, they scatter more or less light. They go in and out. So each particle is like a tiny polarizer. Go ahead. Um, and then the smaller particles that you can barely see, that's just because the, the particles are smaller? Yeah, so scattering cross-section goes as the size squared. So the smaller, the, the particles which scatter less light are either smaller or this is a visible, this is a microscope where the detector is sensitive in the vis visible region, right? Around 700 nanometer is where its uh, 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 sensitivity peaks. So if you have particles that are shifted out in the IR, they'll be much weaker in terms of their scattering. That's the other, other thing to consider. Okay, so that's just a quick example of how you can use even single particle level, uh, you can do single particle level imaging. Uh, I won't tell you about synthesis, but all, all I want to tell you is there's a wide range of methods to synthesize these particles with good size and shape control. And that's the other uh, 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 thing that's very well developed that you can take advantage of, right? There's, there's, uh, um, uh, there's many ways to synthesize these particles, not, use, not only using chemical techniques, but also biochemical techniques. Here's a simple example of, this is my own synthesis where I took some E. coli and exposed them to gold salt and you made tiny little nanoparticles 
that were labeled on the surface of the of the bacteria, and some were even inside the the bacteria. So it, it's interesting. Enzymes inside the bacteria were able to reduce these particles, and this was sort of a, a bio. You know, a lot of uh, there are some bacteria which are actually able to do this naturally. This is one example of making a biocompatible synthesis of nanoparticles. But my aim isn't to talk to you about synthesis, but tell you that synthetic techniques exist if you end up predicting from your engineering knowledge an interesting property. There are synthetic techniques out there that can actually um, bring that into reality, okay? All right, so some examples of biological and biomedical applications. You've seen a lot of those, so I'll mainly repeating this, but it's important for me to repeat this because the, the you'll go through in the lab module sort of connect with some of these biological applications. So I want to see, want you to see the context or perspective of each application. The first application takes advantage of the strong scattering, which I said, if designed properly, can be a million times, each particle can scatter a million times more light than the, your most, your favorite fluorophore, for instance, fluorescein or, or DAPI. Uh, uh, this is an early example from uh, my uh, PhD lab, work from a, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Shaowa Huang, uh, and this experiment has been done very well and so it has become really sophisticated now, but the early example was simply these particles that were citrate capped, from synthesis you end up with citrate capped particles, and you can easily swap the citrate out with a molecule called anti-EGFR. EGFR is a growth factor receptor epidermal growth factor receptor that's overexpressed on certain cancer cells, especially skin cancer, okay? Um, and uh, uh, by labeling these particles with anti-EGFR, what you've given them is the ability to specifically target cells that overexpress EGFR. And so in this simple experiment, again, this is a simple microscopy, no fancy million dollar equipment, a simple dark field microscope. These are cells that were exposed to anti-EGFR labeled gold nanospheres of 40 nanometer size, and that's what the non-cancer cells which have low density of EGFR look like. There's only non-specific binding of the particles. You, can't, you can barely tell where the cell is, right? It's just non-specifically distributed. Whereas on the cancer cells, the particles nicely label the cell membrane surface by specific binding of the anti-EGFR with the EGFR, okay? So this simple visual test, right, now using a simple microscope, you can sort of distinguish at a very crude level uh, between cells that overexpress EGFR and cells that do not. And like I said, this experiment has become a lot more sophisticated. But what's important for an experiment like this? For the particles to have strong scattering. The ability to see them in a microscope comes about because of their strong scattering, right? And so let's say you had in the early stages, I'm just giving you a hypothetical example. Uh, let's say in the early stages of, of, of development of cancer for some of these cells, let's say you had a very low density of EGFR. Too small to be detected, let's say 10 EGFR molecules per cell, okay? Hypothetical example. That would take 10 particles. And I can promise you, you can, 40 nanometer particles, you can detect 10 particles per cell without any problems, and so that, tells you about the sensitivity of the techniques, right? And for that, to, to sort of, you know, to assess the feasibility of something like this, it'd be great if you had some tools to calculate the scattering cross-section, right? Or to decide between two different uh, samples to decide which one will give you a higher sensitivity. And that's where a sc scattering cross-section becomes important. The other application, which is sort of a complement, right? When you shine light on a metal particle, it scatters some of that light, right? These are oscillating dipoles, and oscillated di dipoles scatter light. A second part of, the, a second channel for that excitation to dissipate is through absorption, right? As these electrons oscillate, they collide with the lattice of the gold, and that energy is dissipated in the form of heat. And so you get localized heating of a nanoparticle. And that's been used for a so-called technique known as laser photothermal therapy, right? Where nanoparticles are selectively targeted to cancer cells, either through you know, uh, antibody targeting or in some cases through, through um, uh, EPR, enhanced uh, permeation, uh, which I can talk to you about if you have a question. Uh, basically, by, by using a laser beam that's resonant, with the plasma resonance that overlaps with the plasma resonance of the particles, you can locally deliver heat. And so that's an example without gold and with gold. And if you notice, for cancer cells, you need much lower energies to destroy them. This is a, a triptan, triptan blue assay, 
right, which detects dead cells versus live cells. So for non-cancerous cells, you, you need much higher laser powers, but for cancer cells where the, the particles are very uh, strongly bound or specifically bound to the membrane, you deliver heat very locally to the cells and you greatly decrease the amount of laser energy you need to destroy them. So you can basically make the technique less and less invasive the greater the number of particles you deliver to the cell or the higher the absorption cross-section. Right? If you have a high absorption cross-section, you can deliver your maximum heat closest to the nanoparticle without increasing the laser power, right? So if you want to make it least invasive to other cells where the particles aren't bound, you want to have a high absorption cross-section. So that's a motivation for thinking about a physical property which is absorption cross-sections. A third property that we won't talk about much, but the tool that we talk about does have some ability to, to give you insight into this application is that these plasmon resonances, these oscillating uh, uh, electrons, create something known as a near field. They create an electromagnetic field. Light is, light itself is an electromagnetic field. But when you, when this light is confined to that na nanostructure, it creates a tiny little electric field. It's like a tiny nanometric light bulb. And other molecules in the vicinity of this nanoparticle light up. What do I mean by that? There's something known as vibrational scattering, Raman scattering. Anyone familiar with the concept of Raman scattering? Some of you, yeah. So when you shine light, so molecules, every molecule, undergoes vibrations. The functional groups, the bonds, undergo vibrations. And these vibrations can scatter light, right? When you shine light, they scatter light. And the scattered light, for instance, the one here, has signatures of these vibrational frequencies. So from the vibrational frequencies that you detect, you can tell what molecule you have, what functional groups you have, what is the bond strength, what kind of binding interactions are present. And this, is, this is known as Raman scattering. It's a ubiquitous signature. It's a chemically specific signature. Simply by looking at the spectrum, you can tell what molecule you have, okay? Now, Raman scattering, I mean, you know, there's all, there, there always has to be a problem. It's a great technique, except molecules scatter very little light, extremely small amounts. So if you were detecting few molecules, just not possible. And so Raman scattering never became a very popular technique. But turns out, in the vicinity of a metal nanoparticle, because of the resonant near field, you can enhance Raman by six or seven orders of magnitude. I'm not saying six or seven times, orders of magnitude. And that has made Raman spectroscopy feasible. People have been able to, Shu Ming at Georgia Tech, has been able to detect a single molecule. I myself, when I was at Berkeley, was able to detect a single molecule of DNA placed between the junctions of two nanoparticles by, through its Raman spectrum, enhanced by the near field. So in the, in the lab module, you'll have the ability to calculate these near fields because the enhancement factor is directly proportional to the fourth power of this near field enhancement, okay? Larger the field, greater is the enhancement, greater is your Raman sensitivity, okay? You had a question there. So are these nanoparticles, are they like semiconductors? I mean, is it, is it because of the transition? Or, I mean, putting that, okay. electrons, you shine the light and then somehow That's a very good question. What you asked is a very good question. So let me, so the, whatever I'm talking about here are metal nanoparticles. Uh, metal nanoparticles that have a whole bunch of free electrons, right? And so it turns out, a metal particle has a special resonance that you don't get in a semiconductor particle. The special resonance comes about because of a huge high density of electrons, right? In a metal particle, when you have a high density of electrons, these electrons repel each other. This is like a tightly bound spring, okay? And these, the spring has natural oscillations, right? When you try and compress a spring and you release it, you'll have oscillations. It's, the physics is exactly analogous. When you shine light at the right frequency, which is at the natural frequency of the spring, you can excite these electrons. And the kinds of motions these are having are electrons are moving away from each other, closer, back and forth. And so th this is a special resonance which is not an interband resonance. It does not involve taking an electron from the valence band moving into the conduction band. It's electronic oscillations in the conduction band. It's special, and as a result of that, it's highly tunable, as you'll see in the next few slides. So it gives you a tunability that you can't get with these interband transitions that you see in semiconductors or in molecules. Molecules, the absorption of molecules comes from excitation of an electron from the ground state to an excited state. These are very different resonances. These are antenna resonances. Go ahead. Um, you said you, you, you could do the same plasmonic resonance with silver and copper nanoparticles? Silver and copper as well, 
Um, is it better in any way with gold? Uh, silver is better in some aspects, and I'll give you one example at the end. Okay. Maybe I won't get to the end. Um, so, <laughs> uh, silver turns out, uh, as you saw in the first video that I showed, silver is much more intense at scattering light. Uh, those of you, maybe someone here is an electrical engineer, uh, silver is a very high conductivity metal. It, it has a very low resistance. And turns out the same principle applies to a plasma on resonance. These electrons that are oscillating don't want to have in, too much resistance to their motion. And so in silver, there isn't much resistance to the motion of these electrons, and so the quality of the plasma on resonance mode is higher, meaning the scattering cross sections are much higher. Uh, so same size of silver particle, silver uh, scatters a lot more light. But then the chemical, there's a chemical problem. Silver is very unstable, which you also saw in the video, right? Silver is very unstable, and so that has made silver much more problematic, and so gold is the popular uh, material. Maybe with silver with a tiny coating of gold around it, maybe you could think of uh, taking advantage of both, the high, the, the high stability of gold and the, the great optical properties of silver, and you could make such a structure using synthesis. It's, uh, it's possible, but no one really understands the optical properties. And with a tool like the one we'll show you in the lab module, you could, you could actually calculate those properties, right? So that, that sort of predictive power that we are hoping to give you with, with the help of, of both this lecture and the lab module, but good question. Okay, uh, uh, I'll skip this application. Uh, so, the, I said the, the first important uh, reason why nanoparticles are becoming popular is size scale. The second was the ability to synthesize them in a wide variety of shapes and structures. The third one is our ability to engineer this optical resonance that I'm talking about for a specific bio application. Okay, and that's, those are the examples I want to give you. Um, so the first example, uh, I guess this is sort of the overall uh, slide. This, this has every different type of tunability that is possible. I'm showing you the picture. So those of you who don't like math can focus on the picture. Okay, uh, these, are, <laughs> these are nano rods of silver. These are nano rods of silver of different shapes, different aspect ratios, and they have different colors. Okay, uh, and so you can tune the frequency, which is the color, the absorption's cross-section, the scattering cross-section, the near-field enhancement, all of the, those properties by sim simply changing a few parameters associated with the nanostructure, like size, shape, the medium around it, the coupling, the interaction of partic particles with one another, and you'll see some examples. And those are sort of the expressions that, that sort of you know, describe the entire physics of this tunability. On the left-hand side is the polarizability the ability to polarize the electron cloud of a particular metal structure, that's what that is. And on the right-hand side, you have terms like kappa, which is the shape factor. Kappa is a measure of, it reflects the shape of the particle. Uh, epsilon is the dielectric function of the metal, and that's why silver and gold have different optical properties. Epsilon m is the dielectric properties of the medium. So by changing the refractive index of, me, of the medium around the particle, you can move the resonance around. And that's important for sensing application. You can predict that, that from a simple equation like this, expression like this, okay? So I won't go into details, but all this tells you is there's various ways to tune the frequency as well as the absorption and scattering cross sections. Okay, here's one quick example of why you should know the details of the tunability. I talked about imaging, and I talked about photothermal therapy, okay? Imaging, you're doing cell imaging. Would you need the, a particle to scatter more light or absorb more light? Scatter. scatter more light, right? When you're doing photothermal therapy, you'd need it to absorb more light, complementary things. And scattering and absorption actually compete with each other, right? If you scatter more, you can't absorb more, right? And so this is a simple example that tells you how to tune your particle. At small particle sizes, D equals 20 nanometers for gold, almost all of the light, I guess I don't have a legend here, but the blue is scattering. All of the light is absorbed. As you increase the size, you begin to get some scattering, and at 80 nanometers, you have significant scattering contributing to the total extinction. Right? So this gives you a simple design principle. If you want to do imaging, you might as well go pick a larger particle. If you want to do Photothermal therapy, stick with a smaller particle which does not scatter light. And how does the physics work? As you make the particle larger, it becomes closer to the wavelength of light. 
And when it gets closer to the wavelength of light, it interacts with light much better, and it can scatter that light. Whereas if you keep the particle size smaller, you shut off that interaction, and all of the light is dissipated in the form of heat. Okay, so that's the physics behind that process. This particular data that I'm showing you, you'll be able to simulate in the lab, and this is one of the tasks in the, in the module, uh, properties, cross sections as a function of size. Okay, a second quick application. Uh, I guess this joke doesn't work anymore since soccer is now pretty popular in the, in the US, but it used to work back when I was a graduate student. Um, uh, so um, basically, uh, uh, You've seen this image. This is a famous uh, 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 figure. Is is the importance of making contrast agents, and that applies to nanoparticles that have resonances in the near infrared, right where water and hemoglobin absorb uh, have a transmission window, and that's around right around 650 to 900 nanometers. That's one of the windows. There's a second window here, but this is an important window. And if you can make particles that are resonant here you can use them for in vivo applications. If you don't, then you're limited to surface, you know, skin cancer type applications. And so uh, that's one important thing to keep in mind. And again, right, this is an application, right? This is what an application needs, particles with near infrared resonances. And then you can go back, go to the, the, the principles of optics and plasmonics that you know. And I'm giving you an example of how you do that. So you know what the problem is. And then you, you realize that there's a simple solution there in the physics. And the physics is simple. If you take a sphere and you calculate the resonance, it has a resonance like I showed you at, at this is a gold sphere at 520 nanometers in the visible region, right? No good. It's not going to help you with in vivo applications. But it turns out, and this is something Gans figured out 100 years ago, okay? If you take the sphere and you elongate it in the form of a rod, you have two ways electrons can oscillate along the short axis and along the long axis. The short axis has a resonance frequency that's similar to the sphere, so that's no good. The long axis oscillation has a frequency that's in the NIR, and you can move that frequency around by simply changing the aspect ratio, the length to width ratio. Why? Because a rod shaped structure has a much higher polarizability. You can very easily polarize electrons along a sharper interface, and so therefore the frequency needed to initiate this electronic oscillation is much lower, okay? And that's the principle you're taking advantage of. That's the physics, those are the actual spectra, and this was predicted by Gans, who was a physicist, right? And turns out now it's becoming important in biology. You see nanorods everywhere, right? Nanorods are one of the most popular uh, structures for doing biological imaging in the near infrared. Now that prediction has to be coupled with synthesis, and turns out you can make nanorods of varying aspect ratio, and that was figured out by Kathy Murphy, who's a pioneer who's here at Illinois. Spheres are easy to make, but Kathy figured out, or Kathy and her group figured out, you can take tiny seeds of, of gold, tiny spherical seeds, and in the presence of a, of a, a, a surfactant known as CTAB, it's a shape-directing surfactant, um, you can make elongated structures where you block growth of gold in one direction and allow growth only in the other direction, and you can elongate the rod. And Simply based on the ratio of reagents, you can achieve different aspect ratios. And that allow, allows you to realize sort of the theoretical prediction that Gans made 100 years ago and basically make particles that can then be applied in an application. So I'm giving you the full sort of the flow chart of how you can come up with an application. Sometimes you may know the implication. Other times it may, it may be realized by other people, okay? And a similar structure is the nano shell, but I, I won't go into it. Uh, due to uh, time reasons. Okay, all right. So, uh, now, I guess there are two motivations here. So, a lot is known about individual nanoparticles. Their absorption and scattering cross-sections, their resonances, their near fields. Now, if, you know, one thing is you're all motivated by, by applications, right? You want to come up with a better way to sense something or detect something or a more efficacious way of delivering heat, for instance, right? Some of you mentioned a magnetic field to direct particles. Uh, but there's also the other joy of discovering new properties, properties that may have applications, but you, sometimes you just have to explore. And when you make a structure more complex, right, in a rational manner, you, you have the ability to d d discover new properties. And that's the motivation for this. 
We know a lot about individual particles, but now when you begin to assemble them into larger structures, you can discover new properties. And the reason I'm telling you this is in the lab module, we'll take you through four examples. Effect of size, effect of shape, effect of medium, and so on. And those will be known examples, examples of known phenomena, phenomena you know, of known uh, dependencies or known, known tunabilities. But then there'll be, a, at the end, a, a homework problem or a problem of your choice where you pick any structure you like, any complexity, just don't make it too large, otherwise the simulation can take days to run. But pick any structure that you like and discover for yourself what the optical properties are going to be like, what the fields are going to be like where the fields are located and things like that. So the examples that I share with you in the next few slides uh, should hopefully motivate you. That's sort of a cheat sheet to think about certain structures that you can use in this particular lab module, okay? So it's going to get into a little bit more advanced physics, but you'll see how you can design you know, uh, complex structures by simply understanding these, these rules, okay? Uh, the best example here is this classic experiment that, that Professor Oldham mentioned like three or four times from Chad Merkin at Northwestern. The experiment, how many of you are familiar with this experiment where you can sense DNA with single strand resolution, single mismatch resolution by using gold nanoparticles? Some of you, but I'll give you, I'll give you a, quick, a quick introduction to the experiment. So uh, what Chad Merkin did was he had two solutions of particles of gold. The first solution, A, was capped with single-stranded DNA molecules of a particular uh, base sequence, okay? And these were 16 MERS, if I remember correctly. And then solution B was capped with DNA molecules, the, the, with thiolated DNA molecules, the thiol end attaches to the gourd of a different base sequence, okay? Now, if you mix these two sets of particles together, they don't bind to each other. These two strands aren't complementary. But then if you add a Velcro strand, that's what I call it, a Velcro strand that has complementary base pairs, bases to each one of the strands, it acts as a glue to bring those particles together and you form a three-dimensional assembly, okay? Now that's where the, the physics becomes interesting. When particles come close to each other, these oscillations talk to each other, they interact with each other. And turns out it needs, you need less energy to excite a resonance that's coupled in this manner. And that resonance, that change in the resonance properties leads to a shift in the resonance. So gold, and this is an experiment that I did just to, to uh, uh, sort of uh, simulate that experiment or to reproduce that experiment. These are gold nanoparticles in solution, single gold particles. Then when you mix them and you add the right strand, you see a shift in the surface plasma resonance. That's what happens in the absorption spectrum. But visually you can see a color change from red to purple as things, as an absorption spectrum moves towards the IR the color changes to blue and purple. And so visually you can sense if you added the right strand. So you can sense specific sequences of DNA using this. Now it turns out even if you have a couple of mismatches in the Velcro strand, this does not happen. And so you can, that, that's how Chad Merkin sensed uh, 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 DNA, detected DNA mismatches in there. So very neat technique, colorimetric, very simple. You can do it on, on your bench top. And turns out there's very interesting physics behind it, right? Now these, these, you can't do this in vivo, right? If you thought of an application, I give you the example of EGFR. EGFR is a molecule that likes to dimerize, especially as cancer develops, these EGFR receptors dimerize. You would like to sense that. So this could be one potential technology. Let's say two particles capped with anti-EGFR bind to EGFR and they're close to each other. And if you knew, if you could get their spectrum, you could detect, identify, oh indeed, there are two particles very close to each other and you have a dimer of EGFR. You could calculate the interparticle, the inter-EGFR distance, for instance. But for that, you would have to know everything about how and why the plasma and resonance shifts as two particles approach each other. Okay, questions? Okay, so basically, you would wanna do this with rods if you're interested in doing this in vivo or doing this in a sample that scatters a lot of visible light, right? You wanna take advantage of the NIR transmission window. And so here's a quick example of how rods would behave under a similar experiment. So if you take rods, nano rods, and you dimerize them or you couple them or you assemble them, they do a similar things as the spheres do, the plasma and resonance, so the rods have two resonances, right? Let's focus on the long axis resonance, right? The one in the NIR, it redshifts. 
right? It shifts to the red. Why? Because, like I said, plasma and oscillations of neighboring particles couple, and it's much easier to excite that resonance. Needs much lower energy. Lower energy means redder wavelengths, okay? And that's what happens. It shifts to the red. Okay, uh, that's, that's well known. Now, when I did this experiment, something different happened. When I uh, assembled these particles, so I assembled them in a different manner. Instead of assembling them end to end, I assembled them side to side, side by side. I, can't, I won't go into the chemistry, but I can tell you if you're interested. And when you do that, and you assemble them side by side, the opposite thing happens. The long axis resonance blue shifts. That's the in initial particle. As they assemble over time, which you see from the TM image right here, the long axis resonance blue shifts. So it's not becoming easier to excite the plasma on resonance, it's becoming harder. And that was very intriguing. And we better know this. You don't want to have a sensor which can shift either way, right? You want to exactly know when does it shift to the red and when does it shift to the blue? Why did that happen, right? And so uh, that's when you know, we were stuck. And then we realized the only way to solve this problem is to simulate, to really validate the experimental results. Okay, and that's where the simulation technique comes in. And this is the technique you'll be using. You don't have to know the physics because everything is um, very user-friendly and interactive, but I'll just give you a quick flavor of what this technique does. This is known, a technique known as discrete dipole approximation, DDA, okay, or DD scat. It calculates absorption, scattering, near field, plasmonic properties of any arbitrary structure you can think of, okay? I showed you the work from GANS, and there's something known as me theory, right? Which applies only to spheres. But this technique applies to a wide range of sizes and shapes. It was developed to understand scattering by dust particles for weather predictions. In terms of, you know, the same physics applies to nanoparticles, and both Shad's group at Northwestern and my group developed this uh, uh, side by side. And so, the way this works is you take any structure that you will be able to design in a CAD type software, and you split it into tiny dipoles, little dipoles, right? The physics of dipoles is easy. And that's why you want to split this into dipoles. And then this algorithm takes into account the interaction of each dipole with light. It solves Maxwell's equations for the interaction of each dipole with light, and also takes into account interdipole interactions, okay? And it solves that self-consistently. You don't have to know the details, but basically what ends up as a result of this algorithm is you get out an absorption and a scattering spectrum for the structure you plug in and for the light excitation conditions that you provide, okay? And so that's what the technique is, and you'll be able to, that's, that's what the module will cover, how to use this. You can get spectra, which I talked about. You can also get electric fields. This is a nanoprism, and these are popular structures in, in nanoscience now. And you, you can, you, using this method, you can actually simulate the field. I'm, I'm giving you even numerical numbers here. You see that the field, this is the field of a dimer of nanoprism. This is a bow tie. Is also another common structure. And you see that the field enhancement is as large as 160. And remember I said Rama and cross sections go, go as the fourth power of this field enhance, enhancement. So very large number. So you'll be able to do those, sort of, those sorts of calculations. Okay, all right. So how is the technique useful? So I told, gave you an example of nano rods. When they align this way, there's a red shift. When, they, when I aggregated them and they seem to go side by side, there was a blue shift. So the first thing is to validate your experiment. What you saw in experiment, is that really true from the point of view of the physics? And so the simulation captures that, and so hopefully this movie will work, where two nano rods will come close to each other along their ends, and you'll see what happens to the spectrum. What happened? Okay, could you see as the two particles came close to each other? There was a red shift of the resonance. So it, that matches with the, with the prediction. Uh, and now we'll bring them side by side. Right? This is a simulation. And indeed, it blue shifts. So the experiment is fine. Right? The experiment is basically capturing the actual physics of the system. Uh, I won't go into details, but the physics is as follows. Um, I guess it's probably, you know, it's a complicated slide, so I'll just use an example here. When two rods are aligned end to end, and you shine light on them, you excite a dipole. And so the, the, because of this particular interaction of the two particles, this similar charges, opposite charges, end up close to each other. And they attract each other. You have Coulomb attraction. And because of that Coulomb attraction, 
your plasma and resonance energy decreases. It's a favorable interaction, right? So two dipoles going in phase, charges end up at the very close to each other. You have attraction, Coulomb attraction, that decreases the plasma and resonance energy. That's why you see the redshift. When you have two particles that are side by side, you have dipoles being excited, what happens? Similar charges end up close to each other, right? You see in that cartoon over there. That needs higher energy because of Coulomb repulsion of the charges, and that's why you see a blue shift. You need more energy to excite and assemble a dimer structure like that. Made sense? Made some sense? Okay. Now, those of you have, who have taken chemistry, I'll, I'll take the example even, even uh, further. Uh, quick question, if you had the same uh, diameter, so you have two bars or two rods coming closer to each other. Right. If you had uh, a, a, an individual rod with twice the diameter, would you get the same so response? It's interesting. Uh, so it's, so, you know, um, superficially one can think of that as the same effect, right? Mm -hmm. As an increase in aspect ratio, but in reality it's not. In reality it's not. It turns out that as you bring the two rods closer, mm -hmm. the overall aspect ratio you're decreasing, mm -hmm. but you still see a redshift because the interaction between them becomes stronger as one over r cubed mm -hmm. as you decrease the distance. So in that sense, the physics is different, but at, at sort of a phenomenological level, they look similar. <clears throat> All right, very quickly. From the same simulation, you got spectra, but you also got what I call near fields, okay? Those are near field patterns, okay? Those are for two rods end to end, those are for two rods side by side. Here, the near field, is concentrated at the junction of the two particles. A very strong concentration of the light right at the junction between the two particles. Sort of interesting, right? So sort of some things like this tell you how you can engineer your materials to focus fields down with nanometric precision to spaces where you want them to be, right? So you putting a molecule in there will give you a huge sensitivity of your Raman uh, diagnostic tool. Now this reminds you, if, if you remember chemistry, this reminds you of the formation of a sigma bonding orbital, right? When you bring two, two PZ orbitals close to each other, you form a sigma and a sigma star, and that reminds you of a sigma orbital where the electron density is in between the two nuclei, okay? The side-by-side -side case, right, you can sort of see that the, the electromagnetic fields are trying to run away from each other. You see that it's asymmetric a little bit. That reminds you of the pi star orbital where the electron density is trying to repel each other and moving away from each other. So in a sense, this gives you the analogy that the bonding that plasma and resonance can bond an antibond in analogy to electronic orbitals. So you know, this gives you a simple design principle for taking electromagnetic fields of isolated particles, combining them, and generating more complex shapes and patterns. And you'll be able to do that with uh, DD scat. So think of fancy examples, okay? All right, um, I'll skip that. And I guess I have, how much, I have only, I guess. Uh, five minutes. Five minutes, so I'll just give you one quick example, okay? All right. How does, so the, the question is, we talked about this near field, okay? Um, if you take a particle, it creates a near field, and like I said, you'll be able to calculate how strong the near field is next to a particle. This is a near field, meaning, it's intense around the particle, but it decays as you move away from the particle. And decays very sharply, it decays over nanoscale distances. So you would like to know that, right? If you, if you are, are designing a particular bio application where a particle is sticking to a cell via some receptors and you have PEG coatings on there, right? The field is going to decay as you move away from the particle. You don't want the field to decay to a very small number, otherwise your sensor won't really work. Right, so you want to design the right distance. You want to make sure that the molecule that you're sensing, say a particular membrane protein that you're trying to sense, is within the zone of the near field. Make sense? So you want to know how this distance, uh, what the distance decay of this near field is. A very simple physics question that applies to a biomedical application. And so for that, we, we did a simple experiment where we took two particles and we varied the distance between them. We brought them closer and closer, okay? And as you bring them closer and closer, is using lithography, right? Uh, some of you are familiar with this, and MNTL specializes in such lithography. As you bring the two particles closer, right, that's the largest distance, the resonance red shifts. As you bring them closer, the interaction between the plasma and oscillations becomes stronger and stronger, and the red shift 
is higher and higher. So the redshift is a measure of the distance between the particles, right? So that's like a simple distance ruler. You can measure nanoscale distances if you know how much of a shift you get at a particular distance. Okay, go ahead. Those are spheres, right? Those are gold nanospheres? These are gold nanodisks, yeah. Because they were lithographically fabricated, they were made into the form of disks. Um, and when you plot the shift as a function of interparticle gap, you get this particular relationship. It falls very sharply, and this is a measure of how quickly the near field decays away from the particle. How do the two particles interact with each other? Through their near fields, okay? And so this is a measure, this is a map of the near field as a function of distance away from the particle. Uh, without going into details, we did a whole bunch of experiments and simulations using the same tool that you'll be using, and I came up with this simple expression that the shift, the plasmon shift, the fractional shift, depends on the distance between the two particles. S is the separation between the two particles, and has this universal form. It depends exponentially on the separation distance between them, and D is the diameter of the particle, and it has the universal form. We change the shape, the size, the medium, no matter what we did, it always had that universal form. Different metals, different shapes, different media, colloidal dimers, everything had this expression. A simple physical expression that actually comes from electrodynamics, right? It wasn't realized. Now what does this do for a bio application? So last two slides, and I'll end here with, with an application. Uh, at this, around this same time, the, uh, an application became popular was using metal nanoparticle pairs as dynamic probes of distance, okay? Uh, how many of you have heard of FRET? Fluorescence, resonance, and a lot of you, okay? FRET involves a pair of molecules, a donor and an acceptor, right? The, the emission of the donor is captured by the acceptor, and the efficiency of this energy transfer depends on the distance between them. And based on, by actually measuring these fluorescence intensities from such pairs, you can calculate the distance between these two molecules. So you can, using molecular biology techniques, you can tag the donor and acceptor on specific parts of a molecule, and as it, undergoes dynamic motion and changes in distance, you can sense that dynamically, right? That's how FRET works. There are two problems with FRET. The first is these, it involves molecules that are prone to photo bleaching. You can't watch for long times. The second problem is the distance range between the two dyes for this to be effective has to be a nanometer or so. Short distances. It doesn't work over long distances, right? If you had a long, uh, a large protein molecule, large biomolecular, uh, structure, you wouldn't be able to use that. And that's where these particle pairs become interesting. They don't photo bleach. And the second thing is their plasmon resonance depends on the distance between the two particles because of the coupling. And the distance scales that are important are nanometer length scales, which is sort of important in several biomolecular systems. But for that, you need a calibration tool, right? With FRET, everyone knows, have you heard of the Forster? Distance dependence, does that sound familiar? There's a very specific relationship between the efficiency of energy transfer and the distance. It's very, it's grounded in physics and very well known, it's been corrected. The same thing isn't, wasn't available for a plasmonic ruler. Why, because it's new, right? These are new, new uh, techniques and new principles. And so from the simulations that I showed you and the experiments, this ends up becoming a design equation or a calibration equation for such a ruler. Okay, last slide, showing you the, the power of the simple expression to serve as a, as a calibration equation, okay? What I have here is, are two particles, these are actual experiment, this is actually experimental data. Two gold particles separated or linked by double-stranded DNA. That's the DNA spacer length, right? So these are several different samples with different DNA spacer lengths, and that, is the experimental separation between the two particles, right? A lot of you know how long a DNA uh, base pair is. By knowing how many base pairs, you can get the experimental separation. That's that right there. Now if you take these particles and you do scattering spectroscopy, you can collect a spectrum, and from the spectrum, you can get the plasma and resonance maximum, and you can calculate the shift, right? How, by how much is the plasma and resonance shifted from a single particle? Closer the particles, higher the shift. So that's the shift right there. At the longest distances, no shift, right? As you get closer and closer, you have a large shift. This is a percentage shift, okay? That's the shift. 
If you take this percentage shift that you observe and you plug it into that expression that I showed you, you get a calculated separation that matches very closely the experimental separation. Okay, so that equation there is sort of an analogous, it's, an, it's a calibration equation that you predict from very simple physics, electrodynamics, experiments on lithographic samples that applies to a biological system where you're actually applying the particle pair as a ruler of distances. Not only a static ruler of distances, but a dynamic ruler where changes would be detected, how? By shifts in the spectrum. So simply by watching shifts in the spectra on individual particle pairs, you can tell what's, what kinds of motions the biomolecules are undergoing. Okay, I'll end here and motivate this by a simple, simple thing. I told you about two spheres, right? Where you can, from the plasma resonance spectrum, you can guess the distance. But in biomolecules, you're thinking in 3D, there are so many other variables, distance, orientation. Maybe you can come up with a special structure using rods which have some orientation dependence. Think of some structure, dream up some structure where you can come up with two pieces of information, distance and orientation, for instance, right? So that's sort of a, a challenge, let's say, for you to think about. And you don't have to do the experiment. You can simulate it first in, as one of your homework uh, problems, and then someday, you know, if you're convinced, you can maybe design uh, an application. So that's where I really want to end, but I hope you got something out in terms of the established principles of nanooptics and plasmonics and how you can think about them for designing a particular bioapplication or predicting its efficacy for a particular bioapplication. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>
you can get a, a similar expression for the, the three-dimensional system where this would be replaced by a volume fraction. And that would be a much more general theory of which this is a subset of, okay? Um, I've actually used your tool and I was curious. Um, do you, does it just calculate like a near neighbor sort of, nearest neighbor sort of coupling? Or is it like, like say you had a string of five nanoparticles, would the one on the furthest end would interact with the one on the, like the opposite end? Okay, so uh, clarification here, that's a very good question. So uh, the, the tool does not, uh, uh, has no bias, right? Whatever you, structure you put in, its physics is fully described in there. Uh, you can't make the structure much longer than the wavelength of light, but that's not the case with five particles. When you have a string of five particles, nearest neighbor interactions are the strongest. Mm -hmm. The near field falls exponentially away from the right. particle. And so the fifth particle really doesn't influence the first particle, but it does influence the fourth particle and so on. So as a result, the result you will see will depend mostly on nearest neighbor interactions okay. and less on, on these long range things. But one thing to remember is, at least for small enough structures, three or four particles, it turns out you can't break the problem down into these pairwise interactions. The entire chain has one characteristic frequency of oscillation, and not just one, several. You have different modes that arise in this particular chain. You have a dipolar mode that involves a charge displacement across the entire chain. You have quadrupole modes where charges are, are, are built up in the middle of the chain where you have you know, interactions like that and so on, and you have higher and higher order modes. So you have certain normal modes in this chain which arise from coupling between all particles. So the entire configuration matters. And sometimes it becomes hard analytically. If you take two particles, you can analytically write down expressions to predict how, how the near field changes and how the shift happens and so on. Um, but with five particles, it becomes hard. You have now so many pairwise interactions. And the simulation tool handles that very well, except it does not give you analytical, in, you lose analytic insight, but you get answers, okay? Go ahead. <laughs> The aspect ratio for the rods that were side by side was around 3.5 okay. individual rods. So, so the length was like Fifty, fifty-ish. Bit was you know fourteen, fifteen. So those yeah. So those were the the uh, those those were the individual rods. The long chains that were made were much longer. And then when you, did you see any shift in both of the wavelengths? Uh, both of the modes. Yeah, both of the modes. Excellent question. Excellent question. So if you take two rods and put them end to end. The long axis mode redshifts, but you're asking what happens to the short axis mode. Turns out the short axis mode does not shift much. Why? Because you know the short axis mode, there's not much interaction between those ch two charges. Right? They are far away from each other. Uh, their central masses are far away from each other. In the side by side case, you have the long axis mode that blue shifts needs higher energy, repulsive. But the short axis mode is an attractive configuration, and it does redshift. And I don't know how I many of you. Maybe you noticed it, and that's why you have a question right here. Do you see that short axis mode redshift? Mm -hmm. So that, that's one of the examples where the two particles are close to each other, and so the dipoles this way actually make it redshift. So now you have two readouts for your sensor, and you can sort of cross calibrate <coughs> or cross verify them. So that's a very good question. Thank you. They're sort of independently acting. They're not independent. They are because their distance is still the same. same. So they're independent of one another, but the, the origin of both, the, 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 they both, the amount of shift depends in both cases, the distance between them, which is the same, right? Yes. They're locked. But you could think of a complex system yeah. where that's not the case, yeah. and you can think of a three dimensional version of a plasmon ruler. Good question. So you don't show the with rods or spheres. I mean, could you make more complex architectures? You know, putting rods, spheres, you know, why, why, they are all the same, right? Yeah. So, so there's different. What, what would happen if you mixed rods? And Excellent spheres? question, right? We mixed rods and spheres. Uh, Sarah in my lab is actually now mixing nanoprisms 
and spheres, right? And these are actual experiments that other people are conducting, and we are helping them understand their optical properties. But simply to tell you about one interesting thing that emerges from of non-similar structures is, is simply the following, okay? I told you about this picture, that you see a bonding mode and an anti-bonding mode, right? But you should have questioned me, that's the bonding mode and that's the pi star mode, and those are the ones you, you saw. What about the pi mode and the pi star, uh, and the sigma star mode? What happened to those? In a system where both structures that are interacting are similar, let's say two rods, they're similar. If one dipole is going this way and the other one's going that way, what's the vector addition? Two equal and opposite vectors, zero. No dipole moment. An excitation which has no dipole moment does not interact with light. It does not show up any modes in the spectrum. That's why you did not see that mode. Uh, sorry, that that mode, yeah, or that mode. Same way with the end to end, right? If the two dipoles are opposite, equal and opposite, they cancel out. Now, when you take a dissimilar structure, you break that symmetry, okay? And this picture should hold, still hold. You should see four modes. There you go. I skipped that example. Not fancy shapes, but two different sizes, dissimilar sizes. Now the dipoles are not. They are opposite, but they are not equal and they don't fully cancel out. So you'll, you'll sort of see four modes. This is on a single dimer, by the way. This is on the same dimer that I told you we were able to sense a single DNA strand from Raman. You see four modes. That's the red-shifted mode. Then that's the bluer mode. You see it better in the simulations. That's the bluer mode of the two dipoles doing this opposite of one another, end to end. And then that's the pi star mode and then the pi mode. So you see all four. The two modes that were dark in the symmetric case show up, but they are weaker because you still are canceling out most of the dipole moment, if not all of it. This is sort of the first example of what a slight complexity in the structure can do. But you can dream up examples of much more complex structures, and you can completely predict these properties, and I think with assembly techniques you can make them. So there are no general principles yet. Ex these haven't been carried out extensively, but I think there are tools now to do this extensively. The reason why I'm asking this is because I'm wondering if you could make an assembly switchable from something that absorbs to something that scatters, you know, by... You know, oh, that's interesting. Never thought of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, you want scattering, you have them, you know, two different structures uh -huh. this way. If you want oh, that's a very neat... That's a very neat idea. So I will tell you, the uh, one of the simplest renditions of that would be, if you take a 10 nanometer particle, I showed you actual uh, data. They mostly absorb light. Don't scatter much light. Small particles absorb light, right? Uh, if you assemble a whole bunch of them together, right, in sort of that volume fraction type method, uh, the scattering increases, right? So we talked about shifts. What happens to plasmon resonance maxima as a function of particles coming closer? You can also look at scattering and absorption magnitude. And turns out, as you couple these particles together, their scattering cross-section increases. So that could be one way to shift from an absorptive configuration to to a scattering plus absorptive conjugate. Some of the absorption still, that's a very neat thing. I, I guess I, yeah, that's one other parameter you can tune. Okay, so with that, uh, let's thank, uh, we're going one more time with our uh, oh, Thank you.